All right, we have some bad news. My wife and I sold our house, which includes this workshop. Now, we bought this house three years ago, and we bought it in part so that I could have this garage, this detached two-car garage, it's 20 by 20 feet, uh, as a woodworking shop. When we bought this place, this garage was just studs and outer sheathing. It had just enough electricity to power two light bulbs and the garage door opener, no insulation, no nothing, and I've transformed it to what it is today. And since I'm leaving it, I thought I'd walk you guys through uh, sort of the layout of the tools, the tools that I bought, how did I got them, how did I get them, what I like about them, what I don't like about them, lessons learned, and so that if you are starting your own shop uh, or you're looking to maybe improve the flow of your shop or upgrade some of your tools, um, I've got some advice that may be interesting to you. So stay tuned. And moving forward, uh, my wife and I are moving to the East Coast, and I'm going to start a brand new shop from scratch. So I'll have lots of content about that along the way. So when I first stepped foot into this garage, there was only studs, outer sheathing, no insulation, all sorts of holes to the outside, sunlight trickling in. It, it gets really cold. I'm outside of Chicago. I think today it's like six degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> so it's really cold. So I put insulation in the ceiling, insulation in the walls, and uh, cleared, uh, filled up all the gaps. Insulation on the garage door, and put up OSB sheathing. That was the decision whether I should use OSB or plywood or, or drywall. And I'm actually really happy that I went with OSB. Uh, it painted up pretty nicely. It took a good three coats of primer and paint to make it like really bright white. Um, probably don't need it that white, but since I'm filming in here, I like to have a really white reflective background. Uh, I'm very happy with my decision to use OSB. The way that I heat the garage is with a propane tank and one of those forced air open flame things, which are a little dangerous. I don't use them when there's a lot of dust in the air because there's some you know, explosion risks. But in general, it, it works really well. I turn that thing on, pump the garage full of heat for maybe 10 minutes turn it off and it will stay about 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for an hour or two and then I'll turn it back on again. The lights. So I started with only the two light bulbs that came with the garage. Absolutely not enough for visibility or for filming. So even if you're not filming I would have more lights than that. The lights that I actually went with, um, I think they're Hypericon. I can put a link in the description below of, of what they are but I have so many of them. So they're they both have two ballasts, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six on this side of the garage and four on that side of the garage where I don't even film. And I also, for filming, I have two separate detached lights that I just looked into and I'm seeing blind spots. Um, but this is the, the most well-lit garage within a couple of miles of here and I absolutely love it. Right, so the, the layout of my shop has me such that my main workbench is in this, this corner of the shop and over time I've just built tool mounts and I've just thrown them on the wall wherever there seemed to be room and then every six months or so I take them all off the wall and put them back on the wall in different places um, to sort of slowly kind of optimize the best layout for me and the way that seems to have worked out is this is where I stand most immediately behind me are all of the hand tools that I use the most by far so building this one hand tool cabinet to put everything together into one place was the best decision that I made to improve the efficiency and how much fun I'm having in, in the workshop rather than walking back and forth trying, trying to grab tools. And then immediately to the side of this as close as possible are the drill and impact driver and the clamps. On one side, the safety gear, the palm sander, some of the bigger clamps on the other side and those are generally the things that I use the most. Further out, like the framing square, um, some of these sanding blocks, um, this random hammer on the wall, I very rarely use. And on this side, further out, like the Allen wrench set, I, I very rarely use. So it's, I can't tell you this is where you should put all of your tools, um, but you should just put them up somewhere, in my opinion, start working and if you find that you're constantly having to walk over to get something else just take it off the wall and put it closer closer to you and replace something else that's the the method that i've used and now my shop is 
perfectly customized and optimized for my needs. I'm very happy with it. This is my main workbench. Um, this particular bench is particularly good for hand tools and it is designed by Rob Cosman. I can put a link down below. It's made out of, the top is MDF, which is sort of a bit strange, but it's perfectly flat. I am very happy with the surface of this bench. And the bottom is made of plywood, so overall, and it's, the, it's pretty much all the, uh, flat packable, you can break it apart. I would highly recommend, if you're trying to get into hand tool woodworking, this is the bench that you want to use. I tried using my old, just crappy workbench for hand planing and stuff. I tried to drill some dog holes to make some hold fasts and it just didn't work out. You need a bench designed for hand tools and you should, in my opinion, uh, use Rob Cosman's design. I think it's great. Another point is that underneath this workbench, I bought some really cheap um, foam pad off Amazon. Uh, and they're, they just come in little squares that I guess are about two foot by two foot and they, they sort of link together like a puzzle so you can make it as big as you want. Absolutely worth it. Because I just had bare concrete before this and standing up all day, planing, using hand tools, not sitting down at all, was really killing my feet at the end of the day. So putting some padding under here was a really good decision that I wish I had made earlier. And it is also good in case you drop tools. I have, once you, you've got to drop one chisel directly onto concrete before you realize you should not be working directly on concrete. That's what I learned after three chisels. <laughs> so since the walls are OSB, you can just screw whatever you want directly into them and it can pretty much hold the weight. For the, the case of some particularly heavy things like this hand tool cabinet, I drilled it into studs, but all of the other um, tool mounts are just me taking a two by four, chopping it up to try to get it to fit the tool and just screwing it to the wall. So I made all these tool mounts like in a day or two and I think that has been a good decision. In this corner, I have the all important um, safety glasses, ear protection, dust mask, and you'll see YouTubers say, well, you should wear eye protection because they don't want viewers to yell at them. But I actually really do take that very seriously. So I'm always wearing eye protection, ear protection always. I startle really easily and I don't like loud noises. So I'm wearing ear protection all the time, often even when I'm just doing hand tools. Um, and the dust mask, okay, here's a lesson that I learned. Probably the most important lesson that I learned in this shop was that I had these um, P100 filters, which are perfect for dust. And I thought, okay, that's great. So I can just spray lacquer and put on polyurethane in my garage wearing these things. I can still smell it through here, but they're supposed to work, right? No, the answer is no, they don't. And so I was spraying lacquer and breathing in those fumes for a good two years no idea what kind of consequences that's going to have, have on me long term, but learn from me now. This does not work for those. You need to get, yeah, you need to get special organic vapor filter or something. I'm not exactly sure what these are called, but I can link these exact ones. And I can tell you when you're wearing them and you're spraying lacquer, you don't smell the lacquer. And that seems to me like, okay, that's a sign that these were wrong and I should have realized that earlier. So learn from that mistake, please. I learned that from a viewer commenting actually saying like, hey, are you wearing that for the, the polyurethane you're applying? I don't think that's right. I was like, what? Yikes. So the certificate on the wall, which I have framed, um, and this is not an ad, I'm not sponsored, but that is the completion certificate for Steve Ramsey's The Weekend Woodworker course, which is how I got my very first start woodworking. I took the first time this course was offered was about three years ago. I think he offers it every couple of months and he gives you plans and tons of videos on how to build um, various different projects. And so I thought, well, this is lining up perfectly. My wife and I just bought this house and I wanna learn how to do woodworking. So I signed up for this course and I highly recommend it. Really, you, that's a good decision is to enroll in the, the Weekend Woodworker course. I mean, I, I'm proud enough of that to have the framed certificate directly above center every time I film here. So I'm not making it up. I highly recommend it. So on this wall are my drill, impact driver, jigsaw, circular saw, which are all four made by Ryobi. Um, I think that's a Home Depot brand and they're super cheap. Um, and you'll see people complain like, oh, you have, you have very nice hand planes. Why do you have that Ryobi garbage? And I really like all of these tools. I'm not sponsored or anything, but I see no reason why I would ever replace any of these with another brand unless these broke. I, I'm a big fan. Okay, so for clamps, 
woodworkers say you can never have too many clamps, and I think that that is false. You can have a, it, it takes a lot of clamps before you have too many clamps, but for me, this many clamps has been a really good amount. So I have, these are from Harbor Fright, really a big fan of these, I have no, no issue with them. These are from Bessie, they're the same style. I added some hockey tape to the handles, which is like a Rob Cosman trick, which gets you a lot more grip. These are fantastic clamps. These are small clamps you can get from Bessie. Um, I use these a lot when I'm like trying to secure a stop block to a, a jig or something on my table saw. So they're, they're nice and small that way. And possibly my favorite clamps, possibly my favorite clamps are these DeWalt trigger clamps, but these are just so handy to have around. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Okay, so over here we have um, this hardware organizer, which I didn't buy until about a year ago, and I wish I had done it sooner. Um, super handy when you are just doing something, you need a bolt and you don't want to dive through one drawer that has everything in one giant pile. This is, I found this to be very useful. Over here I have a pencil sharpener, which is sort of a weird thing to ask for as a Christmas gift, but I did it. They were like, what is that? A, are you a elementary school teacher? No, don't ask questions. I just sharpen a lot of pencils. So over here I have my miter sled, which I built when I was making some picture frames and I've used a few times here and there. Uh, but for sure, this is the sled that I use more than any other sled by a long shot. It's just a general crosscut sled. I think I have a, a video actually about how I built it. I got the design from Jeremy Schmidt. Um, and I just drilled two holes in it and put two screws in the OSB and it just hangs on the wall right next to my table saw, which is nice. Over here I have a little glue shelf. There's no organization to it. Um, I recently discovered the concept of using CA glue with accelerant, and now I use it on everything ever. You want two things to stick together and you don't want to wait at all. Glue on one, accelerant on the other, stick together, they're bonded for life. It's, science is amazing. The drill press, the two sanders are over on this wall. They're made by Wen. I don't use the sanders very much, but when I have used them, I've been pretty happy with them. I do use the drill press all the time. It's the smallest, cheapest one that you can buy as far as I can tell. Um, and I just have cheap Ryobi Forstner bits and a bit set, which has lasted me about three years. And all of this has been more than adequate for the kind of woodworking that I do. I don't have any plans to upgrade any of these. Um, and over here, I have a dehumidifier with a tube that runs through the wall to the outside. I run it basically 24-7. I monitor the humidity. It's a little humid right now. I have a, a display on the wall. Um, but it's a desiccant dehumidifier, which is supposed to work better when it's really cold. And so I find that this will just generally keep the shop slightly above freezing pretty much no matter what is outside. So that's also kind of nice. Uh, beneath this is my array of random jigs. This, of course, can be recognized as Matthias Wandel box joint jig, which I built mostly for fun. And okay, there's my dog, shop dog Rosie. <laughs> but the Matthias jig I built mostly for fun. Um, and I wanted to see kind of how he puts together plans and how hard they would be to follow. And of course, I wanted to try to make gears. And it actually wasn't too bad. It was really fun. I recommend buying the plans and trying to build one yourself just for the fun of it. It, it was pretty fun. So hanging from the ceiling. So this was fr from before I overhauled all of the electric in this garage, there was one outlet. And this is just an extendable um, extension cord, which you can pull out 50 feet. And I have found that very useful. So I'm over there on the other side of the garage and I don't have enough outlets for my palm sander and my shop vac. I will drag this over, plug the shop vac into this. Um, and it is, it's long enough to reach anywhere in the, in the garage by a long shot side. So I found this to be very useful. Is that modeling? Oh, this is my model, the proof of concept for the tensegrity table with some of it with fishing line, some of it with string. This is just maple and plywood just to see if it would work. Uh, and then I went on to build the real thing, but I thought it was kind of cool. So I leave it. Ooh, this is a good one. This is my very first ever hand cut dovetail, which taught me that it's difficult to cut a dovetail and also taught me that when you have a gap you can pack it full of glue and sawdust and 
cover it pretty well. Um, I know that's not like the finest of woodworking, but this turned out pretty good for a first attempt because I packed it full of glue. I've gotten better since then. Okay, so this jointer um, is a jet 8 inch helical head jointer. Um, the very first jointer I bought was a tabletop craftsman um, piece of garbage, and I quickly got rid of that. And then the second jointer I bought was also made by Jet. It was six inch with straight blade, um, and that was pretty good actually. And what I did after I bought that was I had decided, okay, I kind of want an eight inch jointer. And so I just set up a notification on Facebook Marketplace, and this one showed up and for way cheaper than it should have been. And I sent the guy a message within five minutes, drove to his place, which was half hour away. By the time I got there, he had gotten three other offers. So when you're buying used tools on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, sometimes you gotta be quick. But in this case, it absolutely paid off. Highly suggest putting in the money for a helical head. It's unbelievable. It's so much quieter, makes the smoothest cuts. You don't ever have to sharpen the blades. You can rotate them maybe once a year or something, but they're gonna last you forever. Um, and this particular model, I am a huge fan of. I don't plan on upgrading it or getting rid of it at any point. This should, this should be the rest of my life jointer, I think. Then you'll watch this video like three years from now and I'll have a 12 inch Oliver or something. Anyway, um, it comes on a mobile base, which is nice because um, when you are jointing something which is eight foot long, you need eight foot to the left and eight foot to the right. So even though I have that space here, I'll be bumping into my workbench or something. So I'll use the mobile base to just sort of wiggle it a couple of feet away from the wall, um, do the jointer pass and then sort of put it back. Also, you'll notice there's a, a window AC unit, which it's not powerful enough. In the summer, this is not cooling down this massive space which is something I probably should have seen before shattering the glass to install this AC window unit, but whatever, it lives here permanently now. I do turn it on, and when it's really hot in here, I'll come and just sit in front of it for a couple of seconds to try to cool off a little bit, and then I'll go back to work, but it's not, it's not heating the whole place. So in terms of fixes to the garage, besides putting in the insulation and the sheathing, which was the biggest help um, to make this habitable for woodworking, the next biggest... Um, decision that I made, which I do not regret at all, was adding a ton of electrical. So this, um, this is a totally separate sub panel. And so I had to dig a trench um, through my backyard to my house to connect this sub panel into the main panel in my basement. I was really sick of constantly blowing the fuse all the way in my house and having to run to the garage to flip the fuse back, come back and blow it again when I turn on the dust collector, that I paid a professional to do it. Well worth it. Well worth it. I, I, I installed, I think, 10 new outlets, um, including 220 volt. I'm, I'm very happy with the electrical decisions that I've made in the shop. This dresser, my neighbor was throwing out and I came across her in the alley behind my house and said, hey, can I have that? And she was like, who the hell are you? <laughs> uh, she didn't know who I was. And it is terrible and it's a piece of garbage. And I keep random miscellaneous tools in there that I very rarely use. And I'm hoping to downsize some of those tools and get rid of this dresser because it's so terrible. If I were to do it again, I would build my own drawers or buy fewer things that need to live in drawers. I think in a workshop, it's, it's good to have some shelves like this. Um, but if you have, if you're running out of space on the shelves and you're constantly having to add more shelves, you should maybe think, can I get rid of some of this stuff that lives on the shelves? I very consciously try to not hoard tools. Just in general, I sell all the stuff that you're not really actively using and have more open space and hold on to less material things that you don't really need. That's sort of the approach that I've taken and I've been very happy with it. So this is my lumber rack. I just built this out of necessity. I don't have any plans or anything. It's just two by four material with some three quarter plywood for reinforcement. 
and they're bolted into studs. You could hang, hang a car off of these things. This is like oak stair tread. This is MDF, pine, walnut, maple, mahogany from when I built the hand tool cabinet, more um, Baltic birch plywood from when I built the workbench. But in general, the three levels, this has been a good amount of lumber storage for me. And I have found that if these are getting full, um, it usually means that I'm holding on to too many scraps that I need to get rid of, not that I have too much really usable material to hold. There was a mouse in here once, literally once, and my dog found the droppings, I guess. And this was over a year ago, and now every time she begs to come into the garage to look for this mouse, I shall never find it. So this is my flip top um, portable stand that I built. On the top is my DeWalt planer. On the bottom, if I turn it around, is my Ryobi chop saw. And these are wings, which are now backwards, that just stand out like this on plywood for the miter saw. I'm not gonna flip it around right now, actually, because the other day, this was too close to the garage door, which came down, banged on the side of it, and broke this locking mechanism. Still need to fix that, but I've shown this in a lot of videos. The one complaint that I have, actually, is that the floor of my garage has some pretty epic, huge cracks. Like, cracks that are go from flat to one inch higher. And so you need really, really big casters if you're going to roll over these things effectively. And these casters, like, man, any crack, they're going to hit, and this whole thing is pretty top-heavy. It's going to tilt over and scare the crap out of you. So if I were to do it again, I would have flatter floors, and if not that, then I would have bigger, bigger casters on the bottom of this. Half of this garage is all power tools, like my table saw station, dust collector, workbench. And this half is wide open because there's a car in here most of the time. And so generally what I will do is like on a Friday evening, I will take the car out, park it on the street, and I can leave it there throughout the weekend. And I will pull all of these tools out, um, all the mobile ones out, to take the space of the car and when I need to move the car back, I'll just shove them all back to the side and bring the car in. And that's actually not too bad. With all the tools on wheels, it's just m mainly moving the bandsaw, moving this, moving the shop back. You could do it in under a minute. And so that sort of flow has worked out well. So this is my bandsaw. It's a Rikon. I bought it used out of some guy's basement. I fit it in my really tiny sedan car, which was um, a feat in and of itself. Um, I have found that it's very important to have a nice, sharp blade. I spent all this time trying to tune the bandsaw, like hours, and all the cuts would go off to the side, or like resawing was just not going to be a possibility. Until finally I bit the bullet and just bought a decent blade, and it immediately fixed all of my problems. So that's something to consider if you're struggling with your bandsaw. I will say the bandsaw that I had before this was the Harbor Freight bandsaw, which is my least favorite tool I've ever owned. Um, do not buy a Harbor Freight bandsaw. That's my opinion. Um, this one has worked great. Um, I don't use it much. I'll cut rough shapes and then clean it up maybe on the spindle sander, or I will do rough resawing. This isn't precise enough for me to cut like a veneer, like a 16th inch veneer. Like that's not gonna happen on this saw for me. Um, so. That might be that the saw is not good enough. It might be that I haven't tuned it good enough. It could be that I don't have a sharp enough blade, but that also is not the kind of thing that I've needed to do. So I've been more than happy with this saw. Okay, this is my dust collector. It's made by um, Penn State Industries. It's two horsepower, one phase. Um, it came 110, I rewired it for 220. Um, when it was 110, it was pulling a lot of current and it was blowing my fuse all the time before I upgraded the electrical in here. And so with 220, I've noticed that it starts up a bit faster and seems to draw less current, which makes sense. It was originally on a cart, which of course I got rid of. And I mounted 
with just a, some plywood thing that's cut to a semicircle. I mounted this and strapped it in. Um, I cut this bag shorter because I have a cyclone back here, so I'm not actually collecting anything in this bag until the barrel fills up. So I just made it shorter to clear out some of this space underneath it. Um, I have an Oneida Cyclone, and I, I bought all of this used um, out of the same guy's basement where I bought the bandsaw from. And I have just took it apart and sort of mounted it vertically like this um, into the walls. It's on a remote control, which I keep right here, which is really nice. So I just press a button and it turns on, press a button and it turns off. Um, and it just falls into this metal trash can. I was a little worried that the suction would be so much that it would collapse or something, but I've had no issues. A problem with the metal can is that there's no visibility. There's no like window into it. So you can't tell when it's full. So I just sort of watch this bag and if eventually I start seeing dust collecting in this bag, I know that the trash can is full and I go empty it. So the dust collection piping, this was a decision I actually spent a lot of time on. Um, I ended up going with six inch metal piping. You buy it flat from a big box store and you fold it into a, a cylinder and it sort of snaps into shape um, with just some aluminum tape. Um, I use six inch all the way along the wall. The six inch pipes are, are much more efficient, especially over long ranges. So when you're researching what dust collection pipes you want, a lot of people will say, oh, you have to have PVC. And that maybe PVC has its advantages, um, but I've had no issues with this at all. No, they're not collapsing when I accidentally leave all the gates closed. Um, they are, I, it's hard to see back here, but I grounded by connecting a, just a metal wire from this pipe to the ground on the dust collector so there's no spark issues. Um, and this was just way cheaper than PVC. So I'm very happy that I used this. So the main layout is um, this goes to the cyclone, this branch goes exclusively around to the jointer, and this branch connects, it, it um, forks off to the table saw, and then it forks off further to the bandsaw, and then it forks up even further to this one long pipe. And I'll drag this across the room and maybe suction up stuff on the floor, or I'll, I'll plug it into my um, planer to collect chips, or I'll plug it into the, the dust hood of my miter saw to collect some of the dust. So this is sort of like a, a versatile thing. And this bit on the end, you'll find, if you're starting out, that a lot of tubes from one dust collector does not fit the output ports of various tools. There doesn't seem to be a really good standardization there. And so I needed something to fit. And, and you can buy like sort of rubber adapters, which you can cut at just the right size so they'll fit whatever you want. But I actually 3D printed this out of plastic specifically to fit my planer. And so it fits my planer, it fits my dust hood. And it's also just like, I just slam this thing on concrete all the time. And it's just thick, solid plastic held on with a, a strap clamp. And I've been very happy with that. Up next is the table saw. This is a saw stop, um, 1.75 horsepower professional cabinet saw um, for 110 that I rewired to 220, which doesn't actually really make much of a difference. Um, if you are thinking about buying a table saw and you can afford a saw stop, uh, in my opinion, there is no reason to buy any other saw. I think they make a fantastic saw and they have the the, the safety mechanism that no other saw has because they have the patent on it. Um, one issue that I have actually is that this saw stop is slightly lower than my workbench. So when I'm trying to rip like a two by four or something, it's, it's up on the workbench. And that's just a problem that I've only recently encountered because I only recently sort of built this workbench, but I do need to find a solution for it. You need to have eight foot on that side of the saw and eight foot on this side of the saw. Uh, to be really um, safely and effectively cutting eight foot long boards. On the far side of the saw stop, I removed the uh, wooden extension that it comes with and I replaced it with this router cabinet, which I built and I have a whole separate video, three videos actually, about how I built it and the design. So I won't go into it much. One upgrade that I have made since that video was I replaced the cheap um, plastic router plate with a nice Jessam router lift. Um, that was a tough decision because I was actually quite happy with the cheap plastic one. 
and the price difference between the cheap plastic one and this one is pretty hefty. It's not, these Jessam router lifts are not cheap. Any router lift is not cheap. Um, but I was starting to build some things that re required really precise depth dados. And with the plastic um, router lift had a bit of a flex to it. And so as I would go over the router bit, the depth of the dado would get deeper and then shallower and it was causing some issues. And so I saved up for a bit and finally pulled the trigger on this. I love this thing. If I were a millionaire, I would have bought it on day one, but I'm not. So I had to save up for a while and I do not regret it. I think this is great. All right, so this guy is called the BMW. That's what Steve Ramsey calls it. It's the basic mobile workbench. So if you take this online course of his, the first thing that has you, he has you build is, is a workbench. And it's basic. It's a couple of two by fours and a sheet of plywood. I also put a bunch of drawers into it, which you can't really see, but I have a video about that. And so it's great for storage. It is heavy as all hell because the drawers I made out of um, melamine and they're just big honking drawers. And so it's, it's great. So what I ended up repurposing it as a outfit table so I routed some channels in here to match the T-tracks of the saw, and I put four leveling feet on the bottom corners of this. And so you can adjust each of those to make this surface exactly coplanar with this surface, or maybe a sixteenth of an inch lower, so you're not accidentally snagging pieces on it. Um, and so I will still use this as a workbench or like an assembly table or something, or if I need to drill something and I'm not worrying about just drilling into the bench beneath it, I'll do it over here. Or if I'm like using a hacksaw and cutting metal or something gross, maybe I'll use this vise. So I still use this workbench a lot, um, but now it's mostly just an outfeed table. So in this corner between the outfeed table and the, and the router cabinet, I have this melamine sheet, which is bolted in one place to the underside of the outfeed table. And it just rotates like this. And when it sits on top of the rail of the table saw, so you could put stuff on it, but it's not, the most sturdy thing in the world. This is mostly here to prevent dust and stuff, especially from the router table, from falling down into my sharpening station. So when I started using mostly power tools, I didn't care about sharpening at all, really. Uh, but once you get into hand tools, sharpening has to become a part of your life. You can't just use chisels and never sharpen them, or hand planes. So I built this sharpening pond. And I actually don't have a video about it because I just wanted to build something quickly. It's walnut because I just had scrap walnut. And it's dovetailed and the inside has a layer of epoxy to make it totally watertight. You can't really tell, but there's water in here all the time. And there's also the, the whetstone. This is a water stone, just a cheap one off Amazon. And I put it in this holder um, above the water pond so that water can drip down into it. Off to the side here I have this diamond plate um, which I don't actually use for sharpening. I bought this before I had bought the the whetstone but I do use it to flatten the whetstone um, periodically between uses and then I'll spray it off in here and just store it off to the side. But I didn't really have any plans. I just built this and it turned out really nice actually. I'm really happy with with how this how this turned out. So my wife has been filming this behind the camera. Normally I'm alone filming on a tripod, so it's nice to have her help, but we've been out here for like two hours because when I start talking about the workshop, I don't stop talking about the workshop because I've just spent so much time in here. I've learned so much and built so many things. And so it's a little sad to sell it. Um, we're starting to pack up tomorrow, but I am super excited for the next shop because it's gonna go from zero to awesome way faster than this one did because I have learned so many lessons along the way. Now, if you have any tips for how you would have done it differently, or you want to maybe share some, some things you've learned about your shop to help me build my next one, I would love to hear it. So please leave a comment down below. And if you liked this workshop tour, this is the first time I've made any sort of video like this. Uh, let me know. I want to hear about it. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Uh, I'm very happy with my decision. I'm very happy with it. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm very happy, very happy with it. I've been more than happy with this. Very happy that I used this.
And I've been very happy with that. I'm a big fan.